Hello, welcome back. Today I would like us to consider the topic of sex determination and differences in humans. Now, those of you who have a biological background will, I think, find this topic rather pedestrian, but I think it might be helpful for some to have a good overview of how sex is determined in humans, as it's often a subject of heated debate and very often a source of contention and confusion, particularly amongst the SJW community. So I thought it might be useful to present an overview and cover the main points you're most likely to encounter when debating a typical SJW. So let's begin. If we look at males and females, we see that there are obvious physical differences. These physical differences between the two populations are what we call dimorphism. Unlike some other species, like sea lions for instance, where the male can be three times the size of the female, humans are not highly dimorphic, but there are obvious physical differences, even when we exclude genitalia. The sex of an individual is determined by genetic inheritance. In this regard, Humans are not like some other species, like frogs, snails and clownfish, where sex can be determined by environmental factors. So you won't change sex if the central heating malfunctions or between floors in a crowded elevator. Intersex snails and clownfish are irrelevant. The fact that some animals such as snails can change sex under certain environmental conditions simply confirms that their sex is not genetically determined. Pointing to snails and as an example of naturally occurring in the sex species is simply a misunderstanding of the basic biological mechanism involved in sex determination within species. Genes inherited from the parents determine whether an offspring will be a boy or a girl. You can think of a gene as a small blueprint packaged in a container called a chromosome. Genes for all the characteristics that determine who and what we are, are linearly arranged on a chromosome, and these genes include the genes for sexual characteristics as well. The characteristics relating to sex are unsurprisingly called sexual characteristics. The chromosomes that carry genes for sexual characteristics are called sex chromosomes, while those that carry genes for all other characteristics are called autonomies. The sex chromosome that carries the genes for the male is called the Y chromosome, and the chromosome which carries the genes for females is called the X chromosome. We have a total of 46 chromosomes. Half come from the mother, and the rest from the father. Of these 46 chromosomes, 44 are autonomies, and 2 are sex chromosomes. To summarise, females have 44 autonomies, and 2 X chromosomes, and males have 44 autonomies, 1 X chromosome, and 1 Y chromosome. So in articles, you might see this written as 44 plus XX for females, and 44 plus XY for males. And this is a convention I will sometimes use in this and later videos. Let's consider the inheritance pattern of X and Y chromosomes. During the gamete formation, the normal diploid chromosome number is halved. This is called the haploid condition. This simply means that female eggs and male sperm only consist of one half of the DNA present in the other cells of the parent. A point worth noting though is that sperm comes in two varieties. Half the sperm will contain an X chromosome, and the other half will contain a Y chromosome. So the sex of an offspring is determined by the male. The eggs of a female have 22 plus X chromosomes, and the male produces two types of sperm. One type has 22 plus X, and the other a 22 plus Y composition. So for every 100 sperm, 50 will have a Y chromosome, and 50 will have an X chromosome. Any of the two types of sperm can fertilize the egg. It is a pretty brutal first come, first serve process. If a Y-bearing sperm fertilizes the egg, the zygote has 44 plus XY composition, and the resulting embryo grows to be a boy. When an X-bearing sperm fertilizes the egg, the resulting zygote has 44 plus XX composition. This embryo then develops into a girl. All the children inherit one X chromosome from the mother. Therefore, sex is always determined by the other sex chromosome that they inherit from the father. The embryo 
embryo that inherits the X chromosome of the father is a girl, while the embryo that inherits the Y chromosome from the father is a boy. We can see from this that an embryo's genetic sex is determined at the time of conception. When we step back and take an overview of this process, we can see that there are four possible recombinations. We can have X from the mother and X from the father. We can have X from the mother and Y from the father. X from the mother and X from the father. In our diagram, we can see that these combinations result in female embryos on the left and male embryos on the right. Genetic determination of the sex results in a binary outcome. Therefore, genetically determined sex can only be considered as a binary category. Males get one X chromosome from their mother. They always inherit a Y chromosome from their father, never an X. In contrast, females have two X chromosomes in each cell. Females get one X chromosome from their mother and the other X chromosome from their father. This is a problem. Two active X chromosomes in a single cell results in conflicting genetic instruction. So this has to be prohibited by women's biology because only one X chromosome can be active in each cell. The second X chromosome must be deactivated. But which one? The X inherited from the mother or the X inherited from the father? Well, at this point, nature steps in on the side of equality. A few weeks after conception, one of the two X chromosomes in each cell is randomly deactivated. As each of these cells in the developing fetus multiplies, the descendant cells inherit the activated X chromosome. This results in two distinct sets of activated X chromosome. Some descendant cells will have the X chromosome from the father, and others an X chromosome inherited from the mother. Females then have two different types of cell. Those that have an X chromosome they inherit from the mother and those with an X chromosome from the father. As the fetus grows, these cell clusters can be considered as generating a genetic mosaic. This is specific to the female. There is no equivalent in males. But what does this mean? Imagine that we could image the brain so that all the cells with an X chromosome from the father displayed as blue on a screen and that all cells with an X chromosome from the mother displayed as pink. What colours would we expect to be displayed when looking at a male brain? Can you guess? Male brains would appear on our imaging screen as entirely one colour, pink. Remember, all the X chromosomes for males are inherited from the mother. Males never inherit X chromosomes from the father, only a Y. Now what colours would we expect a female brain to be? Female brains would appear as a patchwork of colours, with patches of pink and blue showing up throughout the brain. Why is this of any importance? Well, if you think back to earlier videos, I mentioned that males varied more than females when discussing certain traits. There is a larger distribution of IQ in the male population, for instance, but we see the same variation across many traits, even those traits that have almost identical averages between males and females, tend to show a greater variation in the male population. What we have been discussing in previous videos is the proximal explanation for the wider distribution of male traits. We observed how male and female traits vary. What our imaginary brain scanner displays is the primary explanation, that is, we are looking at why such variations exist, and it is primarily genetic in nature. In the next video, I would like you to join me as we explore the implications of these genetic differences. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.